All right, so thanks so much again, everybody, for joining our webinar today. Uh, the title of today's series is called How to Do a Waste Audit. So my name is Savannah, and I am a waste diversion specialist here at Bush Systems. So if you're not familiar with our company, we are a designer and manufacturer of recycling and waste containers, and we've been in the industry for over 30 years now. So my role here at Bush is to support our customers with their recycling efforts and to help them uh, maximize the amount of recyclables that they are generated in their space and also to help them improve their sustainability practices overall. So today I am joined by two guest speakers. Our first presenter is James Watson from Green Event Ninjas. Uh, at Green Event Ninjas, he acts as the founding ninja and has a driving principle of sustainable event, events made easy. So Green Event Ninjas provides services that help different organizations, venues, uh, and other, other people in the event industry to green their operations. And our other guest speaker today is Shantanu Pai, who is the Assistant Sustainability Researcher at Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. So Shantanu manages several different waste reduction projects through their Zero Waste Illinois program. So some housekeeping items to get us started today. Everybody's microphones are muted to help keep the audio clean and clear. There is a question option available on the right-hand side toolbar. And you can go ahead and ask your questions in this space and we will address all the questions at the end of today's session. There's also going to be a couple polls throughout the uh, presentation today so be prepared to submit your answers for those polls. They just pop up on the screen and then uh, you can use your mouse to select a, a multiple choice option that way. And today's session is also being recorded so after we finish up here today you will receive an email with a link that will take you to that recording. So for today's agenda, we're gonna cover three different elements to waste audits. So to start, I'm gonna cover the basics, why your audit's important, touch on some of the different calculations and reporting. And then James is gonna follow up with an explanation as to um, the nitty gritty of how you would actually execute a waste audit. And then Shantanu is gonna continue the conversation with how to interpret the data that you're getting from your audit. So all the, con uh, the content that we share today is going to be tactical information that will let you uh, execute a really low cost but a meaningful waste audit. So we have also created a waste audit toolkit, which is available to everyone in attendance today complimentary through the handout section. So um, the toolkit has different checklists for materials that you would require in order to get your audit started. It has um, some different examples of spreadsheets that you can use to collect your data. And it also gives you step by step as to how to calculate this um, those different metrics in your audit as well. So along the right hand side toolbar, you'll see a section called handouts and then you can click there and the guide can be uh, downloaded as a PDF that way. So to start off, what is a waste audit? So a lot of us probably already know this. So just quickly, um, the definition is it's a, a waste study of all the different materials that are generated within a space on a day to day basis basis. But the term audit, it can mean a lot of different things, kind of like the word waste or the word recycling. So audits give us a bunch of different, uh, different information on different levels. So depending on the scope of your project, an audit can look at only the amount of material that's generated. So we would know the weight of your waste stream, your recycling, and your organic streams that are generated within your space. Or you could take it one step further and the audit can actually look at what is it that's composing those streams. So in our recycling stream, how many pounds of office paper or newspaper, plastic bottles exist in that specific stream? And then in an audit, it also allows us the ability to draw conclusions as to how that waste is actually being generated. So we can assume that a heavy amount of organics coming from a lunchroom or a cafeteria area is coming from employees eating in those spaces. And it also gives us really good insight as to how that material is generated. So audits address ways in which that waste is managed as well. So it looks at waste and recycling that's generated on site, whether those materials can be reused, recycled, or thrown out. So we're gonna launch our first poll here. 
So the question is, have you done a waste audit before? Yes or no? Um, this is just going to give us an idea of who our audience is today and the level of detail that we're going to get into. <clears throat> so you can go ahead and put in your answers there. So there are a couple different types of waste audits that you can do in order to capture these different levels of detail. So audits definitely vary by size and complexity. Um, but a lot of the same concepts can be applied regardless of the size of the audit that you're completing. So you can do a really high level study of your streams and you can look into um, the containers and just take note of how full these containers are and what some of the common contaminants are in those spaces. And if you come up with a schedule that represents your facility, this can be a really good way to get a good understanding of your waste. Um, or you can do a waste audit in a lot more detail, which is what we're going to focus more so on today. So this provides you with really good baseline data and quantitative metrics. All right, so I'm closing the poll here. So we're almost 50-50. 54% yes said yes, and 47% said no. So um, a pretty equal balance of people here today. So the benefits of waste auditing. Waste audits are really valuable because they give you a really good insight and a solid representation of what it is that your streams consist of. So it shows you how well your organization is actually performing. It allows you to determine things like your capture rate, your diversion rate, and in addition to this, there's a lot of other benefits to doing an audit as well. So some of these include um, accountability, visibility, transparency. So when you see a business or an operation that chooses to do a waste audit, it shows that that business is really willing to be seen by others and it implies a sense of openness. Another point to mention is benchmarking. So the audit actually creates a standard in which other data can be compared. So it gives you the ability to set and monitor your goals gives you the option of identifying common contaminants that earn um, a, a really stronger understanding of the acceptance criteria and uncovers areas that you can really improve on these kind of hard to recycle items. Other benefits include ability to manage haulers and renegotiate your contract. So as you begin to learn more about what it is that's in your streams, you can uncover these opportunities to reduce the amount of pickups that you're getting from your hauler and also save money at the same time. Um, waste audits give you an opportunity to work with your suppliers and your vendors to uncover ways that we can reduce the amount of waste that we're producing. And another great thing is that when you have volunteers or employees in your space that are helping to participate in the audit, they're a lot more likely to buy into the program um, and really help the overall goals as a company to reduce waste. So it's very important that when you're actually executing your audit and you're getting your numbers, that you're evaluating this data objectively. So um, this is really critical so that the conclusions that you're drawing from are relevant. So in doing a waste audit, you're putting yourself out there. Um, and I think all of us here today have this same goal of being committed to make a difference. So if you're setting waste diversion goals within your organization, you need to have integrity. Otherwise, you're basically just participating in greenwashing. So it's the people who are actually performing the audits that have a really professional role in helping these businesses to understand the results that they're getting. So some of the fundamentals to keep in mind are honesty um, by prohibiting any communications that are misleading or biased. Uh, using an evidence-based approach, so using appropriate sampling methods, and also confidentiality. So any communication um, should be kept private and professional, and any information of reporting from the audit shouldn't be released without permission. So switching gears a little bit here, um, in the beginning planning stages of your audit, it's really important to think about how you want to divide up your space and measure the different areas separately. So for example, do you have an office area and a distribution area? Um, do you have academic buildings and residence halls? And it's in these beginning stages that you're going to set the scope for your project and determine the most important metrics that you're going to be measuring. So are you collecting overall weights 
of waste recycling and organics throughout your facility as a whole, or maybe you're sorting materials into different um, specific materials and then weighing those in particular. So for example, coffee cups, um, water bottles, polystyrene, uh, and this is really gonna set the stage for the rest of your waste audit. So three popular calculations for waste audits are generation rate, diversion rate, cap capture rate, and contamination rate. I guess that's four. So let's walk through each one of these separately. So one way that we measure the effectiveness of our recovery programs is to look at the generation rate. So this is done by comparing one year over the next, and it gives you an overall quantity of waste that is produced. And it includes both items that will get recycled or composted and what is also being sent to the landfill. So by comparing this total weight over different years, you're able to see the impacts of any of your efforts um, in waste prevention. And it's also, it's important to note that uh, you wanna make sure that your time, your time period is consistent when you're comparing year over year. So to accurately understand these trends, it's helpful to track the population of your staff or your students at each of these target locations year over year and use a per person calculation to account for the changes in population um, that, are, that are actually generating that waste material. And then there's diversion rates. So this one's the most popular one. So it's represented as a percentage uh, and it's the total waste materials that are generated that are diverted from the landfill. Um, some people refer to it as recovery rate as well. That's another common term for it. And it, uh, it's calculated by dividing the combined weight of all materials that are recycled, composted, reused, uh, or otherwise diverted by landfill and dividing this by the total weight of all the waste generated. And in Shantanu's presentation coming up, he's gonna go through specific examples of uh, each of these as well. And then there's capture rate, which gives you a really good idea of how many recyclables and other recoverable material are are in fact getting diverted. So it's calculated by dividing the weight of all potentially recoverable materials that are actually getting recycled or composted. And then dividing this by the total of these materials um, that are generated. So contamination rate's interesting. Uh, it only looks at what's placed in the recycling and the organics bin. So the way that you calculate it is by dividing the weight of trash or non-recyclable items um, that are actually placed in recycling and organics, and then dividing this by the total amount of all material placed in those same recycling and organics bins. So one of the main reasons that we study contamination is because it uncovers key materials that are issues. So contamination rate right, gives you a really good idea of kind of your broad performance, but it doesn't really give you any insight as to the specifics as to what are those items that are causing the confusion. So from your audit, you might learn that you have a contamination rate that's, um, let's say 25%, but what actually makes up that 25%? So in doing your audit, you might find out that it's coffee cups, and then you can tailor your education tactics um, to this material in particular. So there's really two types of information that you can gather here. Um, you can determine the items that are not recyclable that end up in your recycle bin, or you can determine the items that are recyclable, except something's happened to these items that makes them not actually recyclable. So um, an example that we like to use is having a hamburger and throwing it into a recycle bin and then ketchup gets on office paper that's in that container. And then that ketchup makes that paper no longer recyclable, even though the paper is in the correct bin. So during your audit, you might want to separate these two items um, in that respect. So these three different metrics um, reveal distinct things about your waste stream. So the diversion rate gives you an understanding of how much of all the waste that's generated is actually being kept from the landfill but the diversion rate is not a perfect way to measure the success of your overall program, but it is the most common uh, metric that we see in the recycling industry. And then the capture rate is uh, a really effective performance indicator, but it gives you no idea as to how much of the recyclables or recoverable material are in fact getting diverted. 
And then the contamination rate, um, it tells you the percent of material that you're collecting as recyclable um, or compostable is actually unrecoverable trash that was accidentally put in the wrong bin. So all three of these numbers are great for giving you a snapshot, a snapshot of what is actually happening in your waste stream in that moment. Um, by themselves, however, they don't really demonstrate how effectively a site has re reduced the amount of waste generated over time. So determining what it is that it is accepted. So we know that no matter where you go, every location is different in terms of what's accepted in the different streams uh, and what in fact is recyclable or compostable. So it's important that the audit team has a good understanding of the um, criteria in terms of waste recycling and organics um, in those specific areas that they are auditing. So acceptance criteria, these are the uh, specifications of a material that's accepted by the hauler. So uh, it, this can also include contamination thresholds as well. So it's very important information to become familiar with when sorting through your different streams. And it's important that the team knows what material is properly sorted. So some different examples of acceptance criteria um, are listed here. So corrugated cardboard must be flattened. This could be specified by a hauler. Um, contamination rates of 10 to 15%. Compostable liners being required for organics or clear bag policies. Um, required for recycling streams. So within the past few years um, here at Bush, we really have expanded our services to help our clients in doing waste audits. So we all know that sorting through garbage is definitely not the most glamorous of jobs, but uh, it's really great when we can actually sell our containers and see these containers in action and being able to work and help our customers with their sustainability efforts and capture as much uh, recoverable material as possible. So this is a photo of our audit team here at McMaster University, um, which is a big university here in Ontario um, in Hamilton. So we wanted to briefly run through a couple waste audits that we've done here recently um, as part of our consulting services. So the first one is Summer Folk Music and Arts Festival. And this is an audit that we did in Owen Sound, Ontario. Uh, it was held over a weekend last August. There was about uh, over 12,000 people um, that attended this festival over the weekend. And we partnered with them to find out how much organic material they were diverting from the landfill. So this was the first year that they actually had been collecting organics. And we wanted to partner with them year over year to see the difference that they were making. So last year was our first year uh, and we're partnering with them again um, this August. So some of the learnings from this, uh, from this audit were that the organic material was being transferred to a local farm for composting. So some of the vendors were providing compostable takeout packaging at the food trucks, which was great um, to see this option over typical plastic options. But the only issue was that the farmer only wanted food waste for the compost. So any of these compostable containers or paper towel or those sorts of materials, they had to be removed from the stream. So it was also really difficult for the consumer to know what materials are compostable and which ones are plastic. So if they if they got cutlery from a certain food vendor, they weren't sure if it was compostable or plastic. So over the um, three days that we were there, 695 pounds of organic waste was diverted. So looking at the pie graph that's here, a lot of the material was generated in the food areas, the bar areas and the concert areas. And it's, um, there was also an additional uh, 307 pounds of organics that was collected. However, the material wasn't labeled properly, so we weren't too sure where the material came from. So that was one important takeaway that we got from this audit was to make sure that all volunteers and everybody involved in the audit um, is on board and knows the, the proper procedure in order to execute properly and make sure that all material is accounted for. And then we also partnered with McMaster University and audited one of their residence halls. So again, this was a similar scenario where they had recently started to uh, collect organics uh, in some of the common areas of their residence halls. So the rooms were set up to have uh, two different students per room. And then there was communal washrooms, kitchens, study areas, 
And then we analyzed another residence hall that was almost identical, but the only difference was this res hall had no organic material. So the hall that did have organic collection, the diversion rate was 39% higher than the other one. So big difference we saw on that one. So we have a lot more audits coming up um, that we're partnering um, with this summer. So keep checking back to see what other audits we are working on. Uh, all of the audits and case studies that we do are uh, available for download on our resource center. So some of the other audits that we've done um, include Unity College in Maine, uh, University of Vancouver, University of Manitoba. Uh, we did a study with Keep America Beautiful, uh, Oregon State University. So all of these can be found when you go to our website under resources, and then there's a case study tab and it will link you um, to all those different studies. So I just wanted to touch on our resource center. So if you're unfamiliar with the resource center, this was a software platform that we developed a few years ago, and it really has become a recycling hub. So we use the resource center in all of our audits that we conduct. Uh, it's a great tool to be able to quantify all the data that you're collecting when you're doing your waste audit. So once you collect all your numbers, you can actually input this data into the resource center and it generates all the different graphs and charts for you. So you don't need to spend all your time entering data into Excel and creating these charts. The resource center does all this for you. So there's a couple of graphs here on the uh, right hand side that give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, when you're setting up your program on the Resource Center, you can set up the different areas of your business. So here at Bush, we have our office area and our warehouse area. And then we can look at these um, statistics for these two areas and compare the data between the two. So it's really great um, when you need to improve and focus uh, your efforts on these different areas. It shows you which ones can be improved upon. And when you first log into the Resource Center, it takes you through a tutorial so you can become familiar with how it works. And we've also set up a tutorial on our YouTube channel, which you can view. Um, and then obviously I'm, I'm here anytime to answer any questions in regards to that. So when you finally finish your audit sampling, you might be thinking that all the hard work is over, but oftentimes that's not the case. Um, depending on the type of audit that you're doing and the level of detail that you wanna achieve, you might wanna be doing an audit report. So this is something we do here at Bush for all of our audits. Um, the report writings are really detailed. They outline the procedure that you follow. It contains the actual quantitative findings from the audit, relevant graphs, charts, that help to communicate this information. It's also important to include your sampling methods, um, dates, photos, um, and it highlights any of the findings from your audits. It's important to include in these reports any limitations that you've experienced in your sampling and also to include the actual data recording sheet. Uh, and this can be done at the end in the appendix. So just to wrap up my section of today's presentation, as I mentioned earlier, um, we do provide these consulting services here at Bush into, uh, as well as the containers that we sell as well. So not only are we providing containers, but we're also able to help our customers to make these containers really function. So some of the, uh, the services that we provide um, are waste audits, recovery program assessments, assessments of bin and collection infrastructure, strategic planning, education and awareness campaigns, and zero waste planning. So uh, we are also honored to be partnering with Green Event Ninjas as well to help us execute these bigger waste audits. So James, I'm gonna pass it off to you and you can take it from here. All right. Gotcha. Um, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I am the aforementioned founding ninja. I have the uh, fortune of uh, getting to play with uh, a really fun brand. Um, so, yeah. 
Green Event Ninjas, I'm here today to present some ninja wisdom. <clears throat> um, uh, Savannah, I don't seem to have uh, <clears throat> control of the slide right now. Okay, so in the bottom left-hand corner, there's uh, little arrows. Um, mm -hmm. So I can try transitioning for you. It says you do have control. Maybe uh, give it one more try. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, perfect. I just got to keep my mouse on there then. Keep it down here. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so a little bit about, uh, well, first off, uh, we're not the best at being ninjas because we've been sighted uh, all sorts of different places. Um, we wear bright green shirts when we're on site, so we're pretty easy to see. Um, but uh, yeah, we have uh, done work across uh, North America now. So while we are based in Toronto, um, we're able to service clients and events across uh, North America. Um, we do this balance of uh, uh, sort of logistical and shipping efficiency and um, yeah, just all around being ninja-like. The idea of some of the work that we've done um, it has lied primarily in event work, right? So cleaning and waste management for large festivals and events. Um, but really, uh, this has spanned everything from, you know, working with downtown university campuses um, to multi-day music festivals, boasting 45,000 plus attendees. Um, to small street festivals and company barbecues. So we've done the whole, the whole gamut there. And what really differentiates us, uh, sets us apart from, from uh, you know, our competition in this, in this area is that we focus on the waste diversion at these events. So the, um, you know, we actually take the extra step to sort the recycling at each event to ensure that it is being recycled. So um, Savannah was talking about um, understanding where the waste is going. So speaking with your hauler to see what is actually being accepted as recycling at, at that very moment in that municipality from that hauler uh, is all very critical. So we work closely with um, with them and you know ask them. We probably annoy them very much, a lot as well. We ask them, okay, what recycling facility is this going to? What exactly kind of is the kind of waste that they're accepting? and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, we've uh, dived right down to those details. We've s sorted the waste uh, for events at these large music festivals. So we uh, got a little thing or two, um, a little bit of knowledge on that front. So to that end, we do focus on process excellence because these events, they're all about efficiency. Um, everyone is, is, uh, is hyper-focused on the budget line. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'd like to focus on the, the down and dirty uh, side of sorting waste and completing a waste audit. So these are the practical aspects, tips, tricks, and uh, general ninja skills to help you make it as easy as possible. The three areas of the uh, three areas I'd like to focus on today then are um, collecting the sample. So what are some uh, hacks there? Uh, the personal protective equipment that you're gonna require to complete the waste audit and some of the associated health and safety risks. And then last piece would be your sorting workspace where I'll also go over some uh, uh, workflows for a you know, small, medium-sized waste audit. So to begin with, um, bright stickers. <laughs> um, this is all about uh, visibility, um, clarity. So these are primarily for labeling the bags uh, when you're preparing, well, when you're um, yeah preparing your sample and wanting to begin collecting that. So bright because I'll give you an example of what this looks like. It's just really small pile of garbage. Um, believe me, uh, there are uh, much larger piles than this that you will encounter. And um, 
you can see here you can't count on the uh, the color of the bags because for instance your custodial staff may use one type of bag when they're doing the rounds uh, and, and swapping out garbages and recycling and you may use another uh, few types of bags in the lunchroom your warehouse may have different bags etc right so you can't count on the color of bags and, uh, and then also you know if without labeling them you wouldn't be able to identify where they came from and so you do want to differentiate uh, where the waste has come from so some of the areas for uh, you know an office or, or manufacturing facility would be things like the lunchroom um, offices and cubicles the warehouse and meeting rooms these are all areas basically that will have well each area will have a different composition of waste right the lunchroom is going to have a lot more food waste office and cubicles are going to have more paper waste um, warehouse well who knows what they do back there anyways <laughs> but uh, yeah so plenty of uh, you know interesting information that you can gather if you choose to differentiate um, and, and demarcate these different areas of your sample so how you would actually oh I think I lost control of this again Um, Savannah, can, can you stop moving your mouse? Sorry about that, James. I, I think you have control now. See if it... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, perfect. I think we, were, we were kind of competing for the, the cursor there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So... Yeah, to label your bins, uh, it can be as simple as, as this. So, you know, if you're doing a relatively small audit, maybe over the, the course of a day, uh, you can go in, or, or you know, you're kind of doing a one-time audit, you can just go in and uh, throw some labels in. Like this is this is a bin. I don't have the photo of the whole bin here, but just attach a little label, lunchroom, um, good to go, right? Color coded could be the the code of the um, uh, the waste stream. So in this case, yellow could be recycling. Um, it's just as simple as that. Other things that you might face are if you're working with your uh, custodial staff, maybe you're doing a larger sample over the course of a week, so you could give them labels and uh, have them uh, attach a label every time they pull a bag from, from somewhere. Um, or another example might be from in the lunchroom, perhaps your staff changes bags when the compost bin gets too big or this and that. And so what you could do is you could even go in uh, ahead of time and label a whole bunch of uh, um, bags in a little box of, uh, or a carton of, of garbage bags so that everything that comes out of there is properly labeled. Last piece I wanted to touch on uh, regarding this collecting your sample is regarding coordination so some of the logistics behind this um, so these are just some things that we've learned over the years happy to share the who's collecting the waste so it's best to actually speak directly with your custodial staff we find that often uh, the instructions are um, miscommunicated or, or lost in translation literally and figuratively um, from management you know from their managers so uh, Chances are you, you may already have some rapport with them or somebody in the office does. Just uh, if you ask them kindly, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to, to help you uh, make sure that your waste is separated correctly. Um, the uh, second piece is that you will need a dedicated location for uh, your bags prior to completing the audit and then also where you will be able to complete the audit. So large space, good ventilation. Um, indoor is ideal if you have uh, space in a garage or a warehouse. But if you must go outside, you could always uh, rent a large 40-yard dumpster, uh, roll-off dumpster, for instance, um, and then uh, store your waste in there until you uh, are able to complete the audit. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you're going outside is just ensure that it's not being uh, rained on. So check the weather, 
or make sure it's put under a shelter, even um, done uh, before uh, pop-up 10 by 2010, uh, just put over the dumpster. Final piece here uh, is do not throw away bags. So this is actually just signs for dumpsters and compactors. We do this a lot at events because they're just by their very nature completely hectic in the back of house. So we get vendors, everyone throwing you know garbage in the recycling and recycling in the garbage and uh, all over the place. So we use, we just actually uh, get magnet, um, you know, the magnet signage, the same kind that your handyman might put on the side of his pickup truck. Uh, we just get those, they stick uh, perfectly to the uh, metal bins and it just reminds people do not throw the bags here or whatever. Um, so that's just contingency, 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 because all best laid plans are, are, are you know, there's always going to be some, uh, some hole in them. Somebody who didn't get the memo. Okay. Next piece, next area presentation I'd like to focus on is regarding personal protective equipment. So now um, this is just, uh, I'm gonna go over some of the health and safety risks that we that you're facing when you're doing a waste audit. And then also uh, some of the equipment that you will need to have. So take a look at this photo. You can see that it's pretty difficult to see the broken glass there, right? Um, now imagine this in a bag full of garbage, uh, hidden underneath another piece or mixed in with, uh, with, with some waste. If you go in there with an unprotected uh, hand, you're up to get cut. So your first line of defense for that are cut, cut resistant gloves, right? So these are, uh, these can actually be found uh, at regular retail stores like Home Depot. Um, and there's varying degrees of protection on them. Your, you know, if, if you're doing a, a small office, office audit, you're probably not gonna require very crazy protection. So you could get away with minimal uh, cut resistance uh, levels. But if you're in a slightly higher risk setting, uh, manufacturing or scrap metal, wood splinters, you could um, uh, go for something uh, stronger. Um, also important note that you'll be able to find gloves with protection on the palm only and also on the uh, whole hand. So protecting the back of your hand as well. A step up from that are actually puncture resistant gloves, right? So this is uh, especially important for uh, people that are, or, or for companies, organizations that are completing audits that have um, audits of bins that might be accessible to the general public um, you know, their outdoor bins at street level, you know, so this is for uh, storefronts, lobbies, all that uh, fun stuff. So, yeah, really hypodermic needles are the biggest um, threat here because they carry all sorts of uh, associated risks with that, but also um, punctures in terms of, you know, a big one is actually thorns. So if you're in a greenhouse setting, uh, thorns from plants can uh, can puncture through most gloves, be very painful, uh, fine metal shavings in, in a manufacturing setting, uh, et cetera. So again, uh, there's varying degrees of puncture resistance. Um, can't really buy these at retail stores, so got to go commercial supplier for that and looking about $30 to $50 a pair. So hold on to those gloves. Next area of uh, protection that we need to consider is spray and particulate. So look at this uh, pile of organic waste, seems relatively uh, harmless, but uh, in this rotting pile of waste, you know, you, you could look at that paper towel and perhaps it's contaminated with salmonella, right? Or if there was more meat in this and it was uh, a little bit more wet, it could splash, it could be bacteria and, and spores in there that could cause a lot of uh, problems. <clears throat> so. First line of defense against these are disposable gloves. Um, protect your hands, uh, open cuts and sores on your hands. Uh, these will go underneath your protective, your cut resistant gloves. Um, the other benefit of these is just that it makes it easier to dig through waste. Believe me, uh, just having that layer there, it's not so gross when you, you know, put your hand into a big bag of organics. Um, next piece is face masks. Um, if it's especially wet, something like that, or if it's really dry and there's particulate, uh, 
you can breathe some of that in, right? You certainly don't want to breathe in any uh, biohazards or um, anything toxic. So face masks are very helpful for that. Um, next piece are the safety goggles. This is one another one of those areas where kind of make a judgment call on the level of risk that you're facing with the waste that you're working with. Uh, if you're, you, you may not have to do like go with laboratory spec safety goggles like this, you could maybe get away with some large safety glasses, a little bit more comfortable, less likely to fog up. Just make a judgment call and, and just be, but be sure that that option is available to your, to your staff. Some other helpful items, uh, long cuff gloves, gloves. So just for some extra coverage around the wrist and forearm, um, especially in especially high risk areas, all the extra protection you can get. You can even get Kevlar s sleeves for your forearm, you know. Um, a well-stocked first aid kit is critical. Uh, treatments for cuts require gauze pads, antiseptic wipes, et cetera. Just go to uh, a qualified supplier and they'll be able to, to help you out there. Um, last but not least, hand sanitizer. <laughs> just be sure to sanitize your hands um, whenever you remove your gloves so that you're not cross-contaminating uh, your cell phone, your computer, or whatever it is. Okay, so that actually covered the personal protective equipment. Um, third area of this presentation in, and final is the sorting workspace. So how are you going to actually do this, do this sorting in order to complete this audit? Um, so like I said, we've got a little bit of experience sorting waste and uh, we do a lot of it manually by hand. Um, so, you know, there's a little army of uh, ninjas that take care of this at every event, but we've come up with some little tips and tricks to help you out here. So this little uh, finely organized table, um, there is some method to this madness, but first, okay, I'll go over the items that we need to set up this space. Tools of the trade. We need a table. Um, for a relatively small, moderate-sized waste audit, you can get away with a regular six-foot plastic folding table that you can get at Walmart, uh, Home Depot, anywhere, right? Um, these are, are really great for an ergonomic perspective as well, and I'll get on, I'll touch on that in a later slide. Bins, you'll need bins, large bins with large openings because you don't want to be fighting to get stuff in tiny little holes. Uh, so we use the wireframe bins from Bush, um, but you can use any any form of uh, container that you have that's large enough um, and you can fit some bags into. Uh, finally, you do need bags and um, we like to use larger bags, larger bins, so that reduces the amount of time spent swapping, uh, swapping bags. And then we also prefer to use clear bags uh, that we're putting our waste into so that we can always see each bag's contents. And uh, you know, in, in that case, you just have to be labeling the, the bags as well, what materials and what, um, as you go along. And then there will be no confusion there. Uh, some other useful tools, utility knife, uh, cutting into extra strong garbage bags. Some you know, contractor industrial grade bags are really tough. Um, breaking down cardboard boxes, et cetera. Um, weigh scale, so depending on the size of the event, you can use different uh, methods. Again, small audit, you can get away probably just a regular floor scale. Um, use your, your person plus the bag to kind of get a sense of what the weight is. Um, fish or wildlife weigh scales can be used for moderately larger uh, audits, just ensuring that rather than trying to hold out the, the scale um, in your arms to fix it to something where you can just hang it and then attach a bag to the hook so that you're not uh, straining your back or anything. And finally, for really large audits, you know, we utilize floor scales and uh, carts and everything like that. Finally, notebook and laptop, uh, just to reinforce that you got to document and record every data point as you go. Um, you don't want to get halfway through something and, you know, you weren't really your, your notes are a mess. You can't make sense of the, the notes on your page or whatever. Just make sure you're really well organized in that. If you're doing this by yourself or limited on staff, there are actually some cut resistant gloves that are touch compatible with touch screens. So you use a tablet or something. Um, or if you're uh, 
you know, if you have enough, just assign somebody to um, do note taking. So I'm going to go over particulars of the actual setup now and two possible workflows for a single table uh, for optimizing your sorting. So this is a one table setup. So in the first uh, workflow, we have two sorters separating three materials, right? So they're each separating the same three materials on each side. So for instance, it might be in A, you got your card, corrugated cardboard, B, you got your box board, C, you got your paper, right? And so you're gonna open up a bag of commingled recycling and there's gonna be more types of waste in there, but you can only focus on those three um, materials at a time, right? So you just pull it out, put in those bags, and then put the bag aside for the next uh, for the next phase. This one's relatively like this is this is uh, easy um, because you're you're taking care of certain streams at a time. You work your way through your your pile of garbage. Um, another way uh, to realize a bit more efficiency is to do low combination. So you can actually um, work together as a pair uh, when you're at, standing at one of these tables and sort six materials at a time. So the first person, as this diagram demonstrates, would be sorting those original uh, three-way streams, the cardboard, box board, and paper. And then as he, once he finishes that bag, he passes over to his partner and they're taking out the PT plastic, aluminum cans, and, and food waste. Right? So this is just a little bit more efficient, allow you to get through more waste streams. So this is especially useful if you're doing like a very deep uh, waste audit where you're you're sorting it out to 20, 30 different waste or uh, materials. So last piece I'm going to touch on, just regarding ergonomics. So, you know, this can be tiring work. Um, we often do it in the 40 degree weather outside in the uh, middle of summer, but um, hopefully you guys are doing it in, in better settings. Um, but yeah, just like to reinforce, do the sorting at a table. It really saves your back versus doing it on the ground. A lot of people are tempted to throw everything on the ground, rip it all open and, and go at it. But if you're doing that for any length of time, <clears throat> you're gonna destroy your back and you're not gonna be able to keep that up. So the table really helps to keep it at that, uh, uh, at that level. Um, Well-placed and sized bins. So heavier cumbersome materials on the side bin there, right? So that it's easier, you don't have to reach as far to throw those in. And then in the back, you can have uh, the items that are a little bit easier to toss in there, like the bottles and cans and, and items like that. So just always keeping in mind, if you were going to be doing this for eight hours straight, how would you be positioning those bins and setting up that workflow? Comfortable shoes. <laughs> so uh, definitely closed toed and, you know, you may or may not need to wear steel toed boots, uh, depending on the, the workplace. Um, but uh, just you, you make that judgment call, but just make sure you're comfortable because you're going to be on your feet um, for really long. Uh, you could also cons like long audits. You can consider a rubber mat, ergonomic rubber mat in front of the table as well. And final piece, just uh, we've all heard this a million times, lift with your knees. Um, and when you're carrying waste, keep it close to your body just to reduce strain. Uh, waste auditing, waste sorting is just there's a lot of pulling and lifting tasks associated with this kind of stuff. So just do yourself a favor, start by uh, using appropriate form and you'll be able to last the, uh, the day and, and get through everything. So thank you for allowing me to uh, impart a little bit of ninja wisdom today. Awesome, thanks James. I'm going to change the presenter to Sean Tanu. So you should have uh, mouse control now, Sean New, so you can take it away. And just make sure to unmute your mic. That's the other thing, too. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks, Savannah. Uh, like Savannah said, I'm Sean Tanu. Uh, I manage the Zero Waste Illinois program at the University of Illinois. Uh, we do, like, uh, very similar to what James and Savannah do, we do the actual auditing. Uh, and then we also do other, a whole slew of services to help businesses, communities, and institutions reduce their waste. This program's about five, five and a half years old now, sorted 33,000 pounds 
This metric was solely collected to impress my mum, uh, but now we use it for work. We've done about 20 projects. It comes to about five to six projects a year. Our clients tend to be uh, larger institutions, but we've had uh, a whole slew of small institutions like businesses, restaurants who've wanted their data out of it. You can get more information about us and what we do um, on our website, which is istc.illinois.edu forward slash zero less. So uh, what I'm gonna try to talk to you about today is what happens after you've done your waste audit. You've collected all that data, you've entered it either on Excel or a system, and now you've analyzed it. And at a certain point, you report it. And I've been part of uh, plenty audits and plenty processes where that's where that ends. And um, that's fairly unfortunate considering the amount of resources that are expended to conduct a waste audit. So what I'm going to try and do uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes is try and show you what you can do with your waste audit in examples of what we've done with waste audit data. So before we move forward, um, I'd like to talk about why. Uh, at ISTC, we've identified four ways of um, a person or an organization to actually use the data. One, the most obvious one, and Savannah has touched on to this as well, is to identify the material streams. Uh, what's actually in your material, whether that is the, the raw weight but, or even the actual composition of that material. The second is to plan recovery initiatives. How do you intercept that material to move from where it's going currently to where would you like it to go? Third is to communicate with stakeholders, uh, whether it be internal, external, um, just your own team. Um, and the last one is to evaluate performance, uh, whether of your program or your initiative. So before I move forward as a check to make sure you understand what I'm saying, I'd like to, to issue a poll of why you did a waste audit. And um, you could choose one of four. And I'd like you to choose the one that most applies to you currently. So I'm going to launch it right now. Um, you could pick, you could only pick one. Uh, and I want you to pick the one that most applies to you currently. Gonna give it a minute. Oh, so someone just uh, sent a question about they're having difficulty hearing me. Can someone respond to that question by saying if it's still a problem or not? Can yeah. people hear me okay? I'll take that on, Shantanu. Um, Perfect. Okay. It's, my apologies if you lose the ability transition uh, to transition the slides um, as I no, use my... Fine. Yeah, I'm going to give them like 15 seconds. Okay. I would play elevator music, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so I think I'm going to close the poll. And as it looks right now, most of the respondents uh, would like to uh, identify material streams, which is about 35 percent. 28 want to plan recovery initiatives, 8 communicate with stakeholders, and 29 evaluate program success. And that that's interesting because I was expecting a lot of people to just say uh, identify material streams, but it's glad that I'm glad that there's a little bit of diversity in the in the reasons. So uh, what I'm going to do in the next few slides is go over a, a mock data set. We had done this presentation as a live workshop where we created a data set of waste audits, different kinds of waste audits, like what Savannah said, raw data actual waste characterization costs and then uh, work with a group to plan recovery initiatives identify uh, communication strategies and then see how we would evaluate programs so i'm going to go uh, through a couple of slides 
that identify that data set. So again, it's a made up campus. It has nine buildings. Um, I was trying to get cute and called it from Buzzword, Illinois, but you can put this anywhere and it's, it's just data. So the most common way of seeing waste data uh, after waste characterization is a pie chart. Uh, it's the most common way you can slice it, dice it, but eventually people show you uh, a pie chart. And that's a great way to start off to explain, but it's really hard uh, to understand what's actually happening. So what we do at ISTC is we group them together in uh, workable uh, groups. And these groups are specific to your local space, your geography and time. So what is recoverable in Chicago today looks different, like Scott and Savannah were saying, to what could be recyclable or recoverable in Chicago tomorrow. Uh, but what this gives me, uh, my clients and my team, the ability to focus in on strategies after the material stream. Uh, within each of these groups, so what is recoverable in the waste stream, we can then go on and do further analysis, but just as a starting point, it makes it easier for us to identify the material stream. Uh, moving forward though, let's say like Savannah and, and James were saying, you are able to break down your organization into smaller groups. Um, like they were saying, offices, warehouses, uh, labs, however you want to organize your organization uh, by functional groups, because what we've learned is functional groups perform differently because of their function, they're by being functional groups, but also have different needs and solutions. For the sake of this, this presentation, I've just broken them down into nine buildings. So I took the material stream, put them together and uh, organize them into our groups, right? So the avoidable, compostable, recoverable, non-recoverable. Uh, somebody just asked what I consider as avoidable. Uh, this is again, organizational specific. So let's say you're a cafeteria and one of the avoidable wastes is paper cups. You can have a to-go cup uh, program that give a discount. That's waste that we can we can reduce the generation. So that's what we consider avoidable. Uh, in manufacturing, uh, avoidable work, uh, avoidable waste would be stuff that has to get reworked and how you can move that around. Uh, again, these categories are unit specific and then more for you. So if there's something in your material stream or the way you generate that you think is avoidable, that you want to just identify separately, put that there. This is for you to plan with. But now you see nine buildings and uh, right away you're able to identify that building one, two, four, five, and nine have a considerable portion of single stream recoverables in this example that's still in their landfill waste. So the solutions for those five buildings is considerably different from the ones for building three, six, and seven, where a lot of that material, a dominant portion of their waste stream is compostables. So I would like to move now the conversation from identifying material streams to planning recovery streams. So I've got this data, I've organized it in the way that I can communicate with stakeholders and my team, and I've noticed, hey, I need to focus on buildings three, six, and seven. Uh, so I take that and plan a, a compostable program. So from that last slide, you realize that three, six, and seven have significant waste uh, that is compostable. So that would be my phase one for compostable locations. But having been on this campus and worked there, I know that building five is the custodian, is the food service organization. So you add that in there, even though the compostable materials were low. And this is uh, another thing that I'd like to bring to the, to the attention is that sometimes your data isn't all encompassing. Uh, there's tactile knowledge of the organization. And like Savannah and both James were saying, uh, a key part for a good waste audit is knowing your local environment. So even if, even if for some reason your data was, was off a bit, you've got to be able to see that my food service organization has a significant portion of food waste, and I know that. 
something went wrong with the, the, post, the data collection or the sample collection, and we want to be able to, to identify that, which is why, again, documenting your process and taking pictures is useful. And then you can have a phase two with the, the waste streams that have a, a lower percentage, but still significant for your operation. Uh, this lets you take waste data, again, from the identification part to a plan part, both for your organization, but also in most cases to be able to communicate the timeline. Uh, the other way, and this is for places that you, you just don't have the time or resources to do a waste audit. There's waste data that you get outside of the physical waste characterization that you can use to communicate with stakeholders. Let's say this is building eight. Um, uh, building eight um, has a fairly significant recoverable portion. I want to know what's happening in building eight. So I work with the custodial staff and the hauler to get totals of how much is getting recycled and landfilled by floor. Doesn't need me to sort the waste, it just is every week they weigh what's going into the recycling, weigh the, what's going into the landfill. And I can normalize that by per employee, so I know pounds per employee per week. And I can create diversion rates for each floor. This lets me compare within each floor, and that could be a good planning exercise. But what I've used this in the past for is uh, a green office challenge, some kind of way to get uh, these floors to compete or participate in a program where they can improve their recycling rates. And if you want to go a step further, you're looking at building four and you're saying, okay, they have the highest percentage of landfill material. What is going on in, build, in level, in floor four in building eight? So you, you now have a way to really hone in from a large building level data set to an actual floor. You again work with uh, the custodial staff and the, the hauler to collect just simple binary contamination data. You set a parameter of what you consider to be contamination depending on your local scenarios and you have the custodial staff say yes or no and over time you get hot spots of where contamination is a problem. That then gives you uh, some data set that to work with that lets you go to the, the bin level. I want to take a minute here and say that if you're at this level where you're able to go down and identify contamination at a bin level and that's where you are in your program, that's fairly amazing. Uh, you've got to go through the building level solutions, the, the organizational functional level solutions to get to what I consider high transaction level solutions where there's a lot of transactions happening at a bin level to be able to effectively manage change over a long time. But that's the, the logical progression of how you go from identifying the waste stream to evaluating your program success at a, at a bin level. And then you can also use waste characterization and waste audits to evaluate performance over time. Uh, you, can sit, you did a waste audit in 2015, you do the same way started in 2018. And here's where, again, making sure that you documented your process and methodology the first time to recreate it is important. Otherwise, it's really hard to compare apples to unicorns, right? And so what we're trying to do is, is normalize the process per employee or per staff or per credit load or however you want to normalize it, but be consistent in that normalization then you're able to compare it. Uh, let's say you're not able to do another follow-up waste audit or you haven't been able to do one in the first place and you want to track performance, the most easiest and logical one is to track hauler data over time. And this, uh, if you don't have it already, there's ways to get it. Work with your hauler, work with your contracting staff, your procurement staff to get this information so you're able to track your performance so lastly, the two other things that we use at ISTC for, for our larger institutions is use waste audits to help develop solid waste plans. Uh, 
but regardless of size and, and definition, most organizations have some kind of a waste plan. I have a waste plan with me and my partner for my apartment, right? It involves one of us doing something at some point, there are clear expectations, and there are boundaries of what is acceptable and not acceptable, which is what would happen in a larger institution. And to get that granularity, a waste audit helps evaluate the current system, identify resources, identify opportunities for those resources, and then compare alternatives. So waste audit as a standalone item is great, but it's also uh, a valuable tool to fit into a solid waste plan or a larger sustainability plan. And finally, once you've done all of this uh, planning, communicating, identifying, and evaluating, the one thing uh, I want to leave you with is uh, to evaluate uh, how often you celebrate successes. And in my experience, every time I deal with people who uh, work with uh, waste issues like me, uh, we tend not to celebrate our successes because they tend to be overwhelming. But uh, I have a, a list of things where you, you could celebrate successes with um, internally, part of sustainability reports, holiday messages, my neighbors or your neighbors, uh, or just about anywhere. And with that, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Savannah. My information's here. If you have any questions, you'd like to share data, I really enjoy this. I'm happy to go over your data if you like. And uh, that's about it for me. Perfect, awesome. Thank you so much, Shantanu, that was great. I'm gonna transition into, um, to answer a couple of questions here. Um, so James, question for Green Event Ninjas, where do you purchase the sorting receptacles? I'm sorry, I just, uh, terrible timing my, one second. <laughs> no problem. My, my dog's just, uh, Okay, um, <clears throat> the sorting receptacles. So yeah, the wireframe bins that we use, uh, we actually purchase from Bush Systems. Um, so they're the wireframe event bins that they sell and really like them because <clears throat> they're about the same size as the Waste Watcher XL um, in terms of like the strict dimensions, but because they're wireframe, the one side of them is open, you're able to fit uh, significantly larger bags. So when I do the sorting, I use 35 by 50 inch um, bags in there, so <clears throat> allows you to fit a lot of uh, a lot of waste in, and uh, yeah, not have a problem pulling it out of the bags. You just pull it out of the side. Perfect. Um, question for myself: Have you conducted a lab specific audit? So to date, we haven't. Um, the universities that we've partnered with. Uh, have been academic buildings, um, strictly in kind of classroom office type settings, uh, as well as residence halls. So uh, nothing to this point that's lab specific. Shantanu, have you come across that in your experience? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a, a very robust safety protocol that I'm happy to share with whoever wants it for labs. We've done it for uh, Northwestern University University of Illinois, which is where I work, but also for Argonne National Laboratories, where we uh, isolated lab waste uh, that was going to regular MSW. We didn't sort any of the waste that was going outside of that. Okay, um, another question, someone asking about the recording. Yes, you will be getting a link um, when the webinar is finished with uh, uh, access to the recording that way. Um, James or Shantanu, um, maybe both of you can tag team this or whoever uh, feels better about that. How do you recommend to make this attractive to your audience, to get them interested in what you're doing and to get them involved? Do you mind if I uh, start mm -hmm. this one, Shantanu? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the way that the, the we live green event ninjas is just like to lead with the the positive message right and the fun and creativity of all this so you know sustainability is a topic uh, that can be taken a little too serious at times right i mean and 
unfortunately, a lot of the uh, campaigns geared towards general public are geared towards you know shaming and guilting people into recycling and doing their doing their best. Uh, we take a different approach, right? It's all about the positive uh, side of it, celebrating that, um, you know, making it fun. Uh, so yeah, don't focus on those shame messages um, and guilting people into it. Uh, create a uh, positive, fun environment, and people will will join in. Yeah, uh, I like to add. Oh, go mm -hmm. ahead. Oh, you go can ahead. go ahead, Shantanu. Uh, I think the two things that, um, again, my clientele is mainly in the organiz the operation side, uh, and for them, the way I use uh, to make it attractive uh, is, is charts and graphs. Um, I take a lot of time mm -hmm. making my charts and graphs look interesting, uh, easy to understand. Um, I don't have to show them the statistical analysis. I just expect them to trust me with it, but I have it ready. Uh, always, and I try to to use data as a narrative tool. Um, that's that's I think my key uh, message to anyone who wants to make this interest to to make it interesting or attractive is use your data as a narrative tool. Uh, still try to tell a story through it. Perfect. Um, Shantanu, I have another question for you, follow up to the lab question. How do you account for the ever changing processes happening in these spaces since they generate different waste in different amounts on the daily? Uh, we have a, re uh, a relatively larger sample size. Uh, so we take many samples. Uh, the number, the N for a lab waste tends to be higher to account for both just the sporadic nature of when lab waste is generated, uh, but also like I think the question is rightfully asked is what you do today doesn't look like what you do tomorrow, but what you do in a chemistry two lab looks very similar to what you do in a chemistry two lab tomorrow or day after. But again, the, the way we address this is have a large sample size. So we would do a lot of samples to make sure we have some kind of certainty that our data is good. Okay, and um, James, what uh, do you do? What do you do about and with liquid waste? We get especially recyclables with liquid at our street festivals. That mm -hmm. is a contaminant for our local MRF, so it needs to be removed. Yeah. So what you could do is, if you wanted to uh, separate that waste. Um, you know, so <clears throat> get a waterproof bin, probably wouldn't be suitable to throw that into a, a bag, but, but like a rubber proof uh, or waterproof bin, um, pour out each bottle before you throw it into there. Um, in terms of disposal, typically or, or uh, liquids are suitable to go in organics waste, right? Um, so just ensuring again that those receptacles or dumpsters for organics waste are waterproof. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how we would uh, uh, deal with those. So as we're sorting, like one thing that we always do is we always do s separate the lids from bottles because they're often a different uh, grade of plastic, right? Separate the lids from each bottle, pour out the liquids into a bucket, um, and then uh, we can dispose of that in our organic stream. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And that was one um, one area concern that we see a lot with our customers as well as liquids contaminating their recycling streams. Mm -hmm. So we created a container. Uh, it's one container, but it's three different streams. And we uh, titled it the coffee cup collector because the coffee cups, a lot of times people throw them out, but there's still liquid in them. And then they don't separate the lid from the actual coffee cup. Um, so in the three streams, it's the signage on the container lays it out, but the first step is to dump the, the contents of the cup into the first stream, which is actually a small, um, it's almost like a pale canister that collects those liquids. And then the second stream is to dispose of the cup. And the third stream is to dispose of the lid. So um, that's something that we created that's kind of been uh, popular, especially when it comes to those coffee cups. Another thing that I would just add to that, because my answer was more on what do we do on the back end, but on the front end, another thing that you could do is, is have a, a receptacles that, you know, if this is in more of a facility setting, you have your recycling bin for bottles, cans, 
drink containers, and then you have a separate one for paper, cardboard, that sort of stuff, because it's the paper and cardboard that's most liable to become contaminated with that liquid, right? So if you're able to sep source, uh, source separate those, you're in the better for it. Perfect. Awesome. So that answers all the questions. So I just wanted to remind everyone um, about the waste audit toolkit that we created. So like I said earlier, that's available for free download under the handouts. Um, and any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out um, to us after the webinar today. Thanks so much for attending. We hope that everyone learned some valuable information. Uh, and thank you so much to James from Green Event Ninjas and Sean Chanu from Illinois Sustainable Technology Center uh, for taking the time today to share your expertise with our audience. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, the webinar was recorded, so you'll be getting an email. So please feel free to share that recording with whoever uh, you think would find that information valuable. We are hosting another webinar coming up in August, and we're going to be focusing on zero waste strategies. If that's something that you're interested in, um, please shoot us an email. We can definitely get you on the list for that one. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you so much again, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks.